When I was a youngster, I loved to hunt and fish alone. This may sound unusual to most, but it was just the way I was. My dad wasn't so fond of it, and I guess my mom either, but they always supported my choice. Oft times, I would go up into the mountain above the house in the little village where we lived, and there I would make my camp in the usual spot along the edge of the sandstone cliffs. My folks could see the light of my campfire and the smoke signals that I would send out each morning and evening to let my mom know I was okay. We were country folk and kids grew up much sooner than they do today. I can't speak for my siblings for we never really had a conversation about this, but as for me, I enjoyed that freedom. I know that my mom must have been panic stricken at times for just a couple years earlier, I'd been hit by a car and it was not always in the best of health. It was such a great experience on the ledge at the mouth of the small cave where my generations of Panje Sipe Shawnee ancestors had made their camp for a look out up and down the broad Buena Vista reach of the Ohio River. It was a wide, safe outcropping and the cave was deep enough to protect me from any sudden rainstorms. It had been a well-used shelter for a very long time. The ceiling and front walls were coated with the soot from the countless fires built deep in the cave. Scratched into the coatings were images of past hunts and the name marks, drawings instead of letters of those who used the place long ago. It was as if the walls were talking to me and I listened. The perfect place for a youngster to discover his powers it was on one of those campouts that I had the encounter with the bears. I had been fishing at a pond perhaps a half mile north of my camp cave. The pond had been created by rainwaters and small creeks pouring into the cavity where the Buena Vista Sandstone Company had quarried building block material in the 1800s. It was a cool little body of water, maybe 30 by 40 feet and no more than 5 to 7 feet deep at best. I had done well and had several bluegill and a couple of big crappies in my burlap game bag. They added to the big fat rabbit I had taken with my bow and arrow. We would eat well at home. Growing up in country, it wasn't so much that I hunted and fished, but that I learned how to provide for our family. We had hams and bacon hanging, canned meat, and of course my dad would bring home fresh meat from the butcher every weekend. Thinking back. A skillet of bluegill and crappie fillets, double dipped in seasoned cornmeal and flour, and fried in lard, was surely a treat. It was full on summer, and we had fresh string beans, dug potatoes, and sweet corn, along with just ripened watermelon. Concord grapes big as golf balls, and giant purple plums, they were also coming on. In the summer we feasted on what we had grown and harvested. Compared with the folks in the city, we may have been dirt poor, but we were well fed. I'd been heading back towards the trail down to town, whistling whatever tune had come to my head, oblivious to my surroundings. This was not how I usually acted in the woods, for there were always timber rattlers and copperhead snakes in abundance, soaking in the sun on the trails, but it was a beautiful day and, well, my guard was down. As I crested a small ridge and started to drop down into the swale left by the stone cutters a good century before, I followed the deer trail towards the south. Stopping in a small clumping where the mulberry trees were growing, I was intent on harvesting a few handfuls to take home with me. I loved mulberries as well as everyone else in my family. Reaching into one of the larger bushes, I was busy stuffing my hands full of berries into my bag and... Now, some would say... Having caught fresh fish in the same container with mulberries might just taint the flavor. I would assume that those same folks didn't know how to wash their food when they brought it into the kitchen. They'd all be fine when I got home. As I was putting the last of the berries in my poke, I heard a rustling in the bushes behind me, and I turned to see a little tiny face stick out from beneath the greenery, and yet another, and another. Ah! Three little bear cubs. A split second later, my mind and demeanor shifted. I was old enough to know that if there were cubs in the bush, Mama could not be far away. 
as I gingerly stepped out of the tree stand onto the trail towards the river. All hell broke loose. The bushes beyond the cubs exploded with one very angry and very protective mama sow. I smelled her breath as she growled. <laughs> My feet were already moving away, and now most country folks know you can't outrun a bear, and I was quite aware of that fact. So as I was moving as fast as my little legs would carry me, I had the good sense to throw my poke with the fishes and the berries and that fat rabbit back towards the cubs, not missing a step and not slowing down. In all the action, I had also dropped my handmade bow and arrow along that same path. I wasn't about to go back and pick them up right now as there certainly were more pressing issues behind me. I could feel the pads of her feet clawing at the dirt behind me as she was either charging or bluff charging, and at that moment I didn't know whether this would be my day of reckoning or reprieve, because it sounded like she was gaining on me quickly. Whether it was good sense, good luck, or the good Lord just protecting this kid, I came to the top of the grade towards the river. I glanced over my shoulder, and Mama Bear had started to head back to her cubs. As I crossed Highway 52 and walked towards our house, down the newly oiled graveled lane known as Main Street, I was still shaking inside. I smelled a sweat and dust, and that acidic smell that comes from adrenaline pumping. I don't suppose many people outside of Appalachia can even identify that elusive smell, one that predator animals are keen on. It doesn't matter whether you're fearful or not, it happens during that fight or flight instant. I stopped at the two-room schoolhouse water pump to compose and wash myself up a bit. I'd promised Mom that I would bring home some fish, but now not only did I not have fish, or that big fat rabbit, or that small parcel of sweet mulberries, but even the burlap poke that she had given me to carry the meat home was back on that path with the bears. I was coming home empty-handed, not how I expected the day to end. As I entered the back door, making sure to clean my boots first, Mama said, Son, what happened? Moms have that special sense to know when something bad has happened or when you've done something bad, and they instinctively know that difference. Mama dipped us both a glass of cool water from the galvanized bucket in the summer kitchen, and we went out back and sat on the stoop. I told her what had happened and apologized for not bringing the meat home that day. I felt real bad. A lot more bad than any fear instilled in me. I would learned a great lesson through this experience, that you never lose your focus and to be aware at all times of what's around you. That hypervigilance certainly kept me safe during my war years. She wasn't angry or overly protective. She just put her arm around my shoulder and said, I'm glad you're okay, boy. The next morning I retraced my steps up the mountain and down into the swale where the bears had been eating mulberries. I picked up a handful of fair-sized rocks that I flung into the bushes to spook anything out that might be hiding within them. I pelted the shrubs hard. Not a sound. Not a movement. Nothing. For good measure, I hurled the area with a couple more good-sized rocks. Nothing. Safe. They're gone. About halfway down the trail to the mulberry trees, I had found my bow and arrow untouched. I picked them up and put them over my shoulders and moved on. A few steps beyond the berry patch on the trace, heading north, I spotted the burlap poke. Retrieving it, I saw that it had been ripped apart on one side, and all that was left inside were a few fish scales and some berry stains. The string that had held that big fat rabbit to my poke had been ripped away along with that big fat rabbit. They had made a feast out of my fishing and hunting endeavors. Well, that day I returned to the pond and pulled out five more big crappies and a couple of bluegill. Didn't see any sign of rabbit or squirrel. So I returned home that afternoon with fish strung on my bowstring and one ripped up bag. Sitting on the stoop after dinner, I darned up the terror in my burlap bag, making it as good as new. Misadventures like this have foddered many engaged audiences for decades. And this is a true story. Not exaggeration, just fact. I lived in a different time in the Appalachian foothills, in a different world than most. I am blessed that I had the opportunity to live in the shadows of those wonderful mountains and hills and on the mud flats of the river that my ancestors called the Splelo Asipe, the mighty waterway that opened to the world beyond, beyond the ancient Appalachian mountains. 
It was the mystical place of my youth where I learned my magic, the ancient discovery and understanding of all things in my homeland and how they relate to each other and their powers. And I became a strong two-legged. It's not that my life was any more special than anyone else's. Everyone has memories that make them who they are. I'm not unique. I just came from a different time and a different place. Do you recall stories told you by your grandparents and elders that intrigued you and en entranced you? If so, honor them and record them in written word or digital recording for the generations to come, to enjoy, to learn. The stories that your elders shared with you are your history, and they tell of how you became the you that you are. Everyone has a story. What is yours? Some bear facts. The black bear is between four and seven feet in length and two to three feet tall. Its small eyes, round ear and long snout, along with its long shaggy haired body, fit our concept of the perfect bear. It's rarely dangerous to humans unless threatened. Bears have always been a native to Ohio and were said to have been in great numbers at the turn of the 19th century. Ursus Americanus, America Black Bear, were nearly driven to extinction by early settlers. Today, the settlers are gone and the woodlands have regrown and the bears are returning from the neighboring states to establish their own home ranges again. The Ohio Division of Wildlife has an acronym for the rules on what to do when faced with the black bear. It's called AWARE, A-W-A-R-E. A, act calm and do not run. W, warn the bear that you're near. Talk in a firm, calm voice. A, allow space between you and the bear. Step aside and slowly back away. Do not make the bear feel trapped or threatened. Raise your hands above your head to appear larger if the bear approaches. Clap your hands or shout to scare the bear away. E. Exit the area, which to most folks seems to be the most practical advice of all. The people at bearlife.org share this advice. Black bears are shy and normally avoid people. Human attacks are rare. Still, one should not get too close to them or feed them. They may become protective if cubs are present and may bluff intruders with fake charges. So, when faced with a black bear, always be aware.